chance they want to stay out once he ain't got below. This picture is the story of my people. I speak for that cause, I know your language. In the beginning, the Great Spirit gave us this hand. The wild game was our hunt. We were hopping when game was plenty. In the years of famine, we suffered. Soon we will be gone. Your civilization will destroy us. But by your magic, we will live forever. We thank the white who helped us to make this picture. They came to our forest. They share our hardships. They listened to our old man, the campfire. We told the stories of our grandfathers. That is why this picture is looked not upon us actors. We are living our own life to the us we live it yesterday. Everything you see is as it always has been. Buckskin clothes, our birch bark canoes, our wigwams, and our bows and arrows. All were made by my people just as they always have done. Only six of these Indians have ever a motion picture. Many of them are still in the forest, hunting the game that is ever growing less. Still living the great drama of the North, this struggle for meat, a never ending fight against this silent enemy. Before the white man came to America, when all the land still belonged to the red man, the Ojibwe tribe had a small encampment by a riverside where they lingered in the seductive haze of Indian summer. Chief Chitoga was happy. As he gazed down upon the river, his heart was glad. For there, his own young son was practicing the arts that would surely make the lad a mighty hunter someday. Only this morning, the chief had taken the charm off his own spear and had given it to Chica. From now on, the sacred things would bring good luck to the weapons of the sun, with such a charm to guide the weapon. Chica's spear was sure to find its mark. Oh ho, how nice and fat the beaver were this fall. Chica would catch some beaver pretty soon. Good eating they were, and how their soft, warm skins kept out the cold of the biting winter. To be famous in the tribe as a good hunter, Baluk was famous among the Ojibwe's. Baluk was easily their greatest hunter. The meat rack at Bollock's teepee was rarely empty. His mother had lots of skins to make into clothing, and ever more meat did Bollock fetch home. The chief was anxious about his daughter, Niwa. 
she had not been seen since early morning. Had anyone seen her? Yes, the old neighbor woman had seen Niwa early that morning. She was going to the cliff at the Long Lake. She went there to snare partridge. Baluk heard. He knew that cliff to be a dangerous place. Baluk would paddle across the lake at once to see that no harm came to Niwa, the girl he hoped to make his wife. Niwa was out on the cliff with little sister. In Niwa's mind, there were no thoughts of danger. The Indians call this small hunting, and Indian girls were proud to be good at it. Hunting was good today. Niwa's luck had been with her all that day. But now, a huge she-bear guarding her cubs in a nearby den. hunt for the cubs. While Baloch procures the valuable skin, the meat may be called for later. And while Baloch is preparing a sack, Bundles of anger, teeth, and claws. But they're in the bag soon enough. Chica worshipped Balog, and the friendship was returned. As a token, Balog gave the little bears to Chica. 
warning him not to let his head be bitten off. <laughs> Chico would tame them soon enough. The girl, Niwa, feared she might have to marry the medicine man of the tribe, Dogwan, an evil, tricky fellow. If she refused, he might work fearful magic. Balok swore to protect her from Dogwan. Niwa should marry Balok and not Dogwan. And Dogwan heard and stored the words in his evil heart. <laughs> Chief Chitogo was talking to his men. There had been six fat years. Now would come the seventh year, starvation and death. Balok must lead the men on a great hunt. Only so could the tribe survive the coming hunger. As the sun was rising on the next day, the tribe was up and stirring. Chief Chitogo's orders were being carried out. Baluk was leading the hunters to the forests of the south for a great hunt to stave off the hunger of the coming seventh year. Game was now at its best, but soon winter would be here. Chica, too, was getting ready for the trip. He could not leave his little bears behind. They might forget to feed them or something. No, he must take them along. How many would fail to return? No, Chica could not come. He was much too young. Dogwan did not have to be stopped. He sneered. Ha! Huh, Bollock was a fool. They had not even taken snowshoes. They would surely fail. But Chica was made of better stuff. Would someone help him to get his bears in his canoe? Too young, was he? <laughs> he would show Balok that Chica was a man with the men. And off he was, after the men, as fast as the river would carry him.
wherever fellers needed a friend, these youngsters needed one now. It seemed like years. But at last came the friend. Chica doubted if Bollock was still his friend. Would a friend send one home like this? It was not many days before the north wind came howling through the forest. The wild geese took rapid flight for warmer places south. Then suddenly, winter buried the forest deep in snow. Safely at home, the tricky Dogwan went into the forest to hunt. If Dogwan could show the chief that he, Dogwan, was a better hunter than Bollock, surely Dogwan would get Niwa for wife. What Indian father would not give his daughter to the best provider? if Bollock would only fail on that hunting trip. Dogwan let it be known in the camp that he could catch game in the home forest without leading the men far away. Chica's little bears were growing up. That dog had waited day after day for this chance. Now they would fight it out. fights and runs away, lives to fight another day. Even little bears know that. At last the hunters came back from the trip. Dog One's wish was fulfilled. Baluk had failed, miserably. The men came back empty-handed. Bob.
Moloch had to confess his failure to the chief. There was no game in the forest anywhere. The tribe must move away from this land of coming hunger, or the tribe would perish. Chief Shatoga still had faith in Bala. The chief would call a council of the men. Niwa, too, still had faith. Let Dogwan laugh. That one deer did not make Dogwan a great hunter. At the council, Balak urged his brothers to go north, away from this land of hunger, to the north where the herds of caribou make food for 20 nations. The older men agree with that. Not so, Dogwan. If Balak leads the tribe into disaster, Balak must be held responsible. Bala will have to pay the price. But the chief decided to act on Bala's counsel. At dawn, you will roll the bark of your teepees. The tribe goes north to the land of caribou. At sunrise, it was done as the chief had ordered. The cold morning sun beheld the tribe getting ready for the long, long trail north. Men, women, children, dogs, all helped to take the tribe safely beyond the reach of starvation's bony grip. Into the biting winds they moved, through silent, empty forests, or frozen lakes and wind-swept hills, into ever-increasing cold. Not for long could any one man remain at the head of the column. Another had to move up and relieve him at the racking job of breaking trail. Each day a greater trial than the last. At length they had to halt, their strength completely spent. By now their dogs were so fierce with hunger that they sought to kill and eat one another. That night, another danger came upon them. The killer of the forest, a mountain lion, nine feet from tip to tip. was being devoured. And then the unexpected happened.
why don't you go out and fetch in that deer? Who, me? What's the matter with you? These dreary nights, Baloch was far away from camp, hunting alone, determined to feed his people. Suddenly, gray shadows streak through the night. Wolves, a pack of wolves. There must be game. Baloch made after them. Not far away, a young bull moose, alert at the sound of howling wolves. Beasts attacked as a pack of wolves always attacks. A vicious circle around their victim. Now here, now there, a flash of fangs, a bite, a slash. tribe, won by a deed that would ever be talked of when campfires were burning. Now that Baluk had brought in meat to last for many a day, the chief again had ordered the tribe on the march. region where trees can no longer grow because of the icy cold. Day after day, the same terrific hardships with new ones added. that had started were now alive. Now and then, one fell by the wayside, never to rise again. After week, they brave the bitterest hardships till, at last, they reach the open barrens, the storm-swept lands across which the great herds of caribou move. 
In a sheltered valley, in a clump of trees, the Ojibways had set up their teepees. The men were gathered for a council in the teepee of their chief, Chitoga. Dogwan accused Balok of having caused the misery of the tribe. But the herds of caribou are sure to come. Bah, the tribe is dying while this man talks of caribou. Chief Chitoga stops their quarrel. He will go to the mountain top. Alone he will fast and watch until the Great Spirit gives him a sign. So they prepare their chief for his holy office. The tribe is told of their chief's decision. Chitoga begs them to have courage and now he throws his life into the balance that the tribe may live. Far up to a mountain peak close to the sky, Chief Chitoga ascends to seek the counsel and guidance that would end the suffering of his people. Surrounded by all his sacred things, the chief will salute the sun each day on rising and on setting. Alone and fasting is every thought for the welfare of his tribe. Chitoga would wait for the sign. His men had orders not to come for him until they had good hunting. Meantime, Baloch worked night and day. He placed his scouts at many points. Signal fires were ready to be lighted at the first sign of the expected herds of caribou. Still a great spirit had not relented. Chief Chitoga continued his watch on the mountaintop, a lonely figure in the vast and frozen silence. From fasting and exposure, the chief had at last to be carried to his teepee. His hours in this world were counted. He felt the approach of a spirit canoe that was to carry him over the Milky Way to the happy hunting ground. Behold the spirit canoe. With his last words, Chitoga made Balak the new chief. The tribe was to stay and wait. The caribou would surely come. His war bonnet to show his rank. His battle staff to recount his brave deeds in this world. His sacred medicine bag to protect his soul from harm. All these must go with a chief when he passes over to face his creator.
deep sorrow held the Ojibways as they mourned their chief, Chitoga. In silent sorrow sat Niwa, mourning her father. Baluk begged her to come away. Chitoga would not want her to mourn longer. Soon their troubles would end. There would be food. Out there, the signal fires would soon flare up. Not long before Niwa became his wife. Dagwan assembled the men in the medicine lodge. It was a sad and broken people that answered the drums. Chitoga was gone. Who could stop Dagwan from doing away with Balok now? So Dagwan excited the tribe against Balok. Men, women, children were dying of hunger. Who is responsible for all this suffering? Balak. Once more, Dogwan would pray to the Great Spirit. This time they must obey his message. If not, they would perish, all of them. shall explain the power of the Indian medicine man to control the forces of nature. As Dogwan danced, a howling storm came up. It seemed to rock the earth. In that tempest, Dogwan heard the great spirit roar. I am angry with your tribe. There'll be no caribou while Balok lives. Balok is guilty. Balok must die. Balok foresaw the end. Dogwan had won the tribe against him, and Dogwan had won. This was the end for Bala. True, he had failed. The tribe was dying of hunger, and Bala, their chief, had failed them. Men, do not think it's Dogwan who commands this thing. No, it's the great Manitou who demands this sacrifice of Bala's life. Hark, they come, singing the death chant for Bala. Great Spirit demands your life. Choose the manner of your death. I die like a chief, by fire. Already the chief's white robe was being laid on the shoulders of Dogwan. 
and while the women were building the fire, Niwa collected her husband's personal things, as well as all his weapons, to bring them to the burning, that he might have them in the other world. As Dogwan hurried the building of the fire, he told his hope that his death would bring them luck and happiness. In vain did Dogwan's crafty eyes search Niwa's sorrowing face for a sign of hope. Remember, men, I die not like a dog, I die like a chief of the Ojibwe. Silence the chief takes leave forever of Niwa, his young wife, and of his mother. Farewell. When Chica has grown to be a great hunter, Chica will smoke the council pipe of Bala in memory of his friend. Farewell, Chica. Blood ran 
cold as he heard these cries of caribou. With all her love, Niwa recalled her husband from the long trail on which his spirit had already started. Follow, hear me, the caribou are here. The light of dawn found every hunter at the post to which Balak, again their chief, had assigned him. stream of caribou was coming. Gloriously, the faith of Bollock was rewarded. come when Dog One had to reckon with Barlow. Dog One knew the penalty of the tribe for making false medicine in the name of a great spirit. You are judged unworthy of the death of an Indian brave. Yours shall be the slow death without food, without weapons, 
you will take the long trail into the barren land, never more to return. And Dot Juan bowed to the law of the tribe. With empty hands, he started on the trail that led to eternal silence. Not one in all the tribe regretted the passing of this evil man, Dogwan. In their new village, the teepee snug and warm, made with the skins of the caribou, they gave themselves over to feasting and merrymaking after their long stretch of hunger. Chica. And with Niwa lovelier than ever. That is where Baloch speared the bull moose, do you remember? Starvation. Far behind lie all their troubles. Once again, these fearless people have conquered hunger, their ever threatening silent enemy. Mm -hmm. 